Uh, Mr. Chairman, thanks for your work on uh, helping to get us back to this point. This is part two of a process, and I wanted to uh, be on the record by indicating that we on this side of the aisle welcome uh, the opportunity to uh, conclude, if not finish completely, um, the discussions and the oversight that we've had on this matter. I want to set the tone of uh, this hearing by focusing uh, on two words, and that is efficiency and effectiveness. And I believe that members of this subcommittee work together uh, to execute that mission to the best of our abilities. And so on behalf of the people we serve, you will hear me reiterate again those words, effective and efficient throughout this hearing. To that extent, I expect each agency to operate and execute their unique mission effectively and efficiently, whether their employees are working entirely remotely, remotely or working hybrid uh, or telework schedules that uh, require some in-person working as well. During the pandemic uh, that we were all so happy to get behind us, government agencies increased their dependence on telework and remote work agreements, finding ways to serve the nation in the midst of a deadly public health crisis. Earlier this year, as I indicated, we hosted part one of this hearing series and our agency witnesses made it clear to those of us who were present that prioritizing data collection to gauge and improve their performance was absolutely critical to ensuring that the agency's workforce policies drive exceptional service. We believe, I know I certainly do, and I, I think that many of you do also, that the American people deserve the best performance that agencies can provide. This subcommittee, hence, then will really not tolerate, nor should we, inexcusable things like absenteeism that is undocumented or poor productivity with no plan to increase it, uh, or some of the horror stories that we've seen as we've followed this issue. As one who has fought valiantly to make sure that our agencies are protected and supported, I'm really pleased to learn that those same agencies that came before us possess, or at least say they do, the tracking systems uh, necessary and are employing the metrics necessary to gauge employee performance. So the last thing I want to do is to force agencies to adopt policies that are not conducive to their mission or that fail to attract and retain top talent. As I've said before, I encourage agencies that can increase in-person work, uh, as the President has stated repeatedly, to do so as necessary for the successful delivery of their agency's mission. Uh, meanwhile, and concurrently, uh, getting the House of Representatives and the floor of the House moving again by passing a continuing resolution was only half of the battle that we face here in the Congress. We have, as most of you know, roughly eight weeks uh, before we're faced with another possible government shutdown. And that, my friends, is not efficient or effective. We're now in a permanent state of lurching from one near government shutdown to another looming one on the horizon. And we know that short-term temporary spending bills can and often do create unnecessary work and uncertainty for federal agencies and for our constituents who rely on those agencies for life-saving programs. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent to insert in the record a recent Washington Post article about the massive headaches that successive shutdown threats cause to federal workers, agencies, and contractors. Without objection. Thank you. If Congress uh, can't pass an appropriations package, agency employees will be rendered hopelessly unproductive because you can't work uh, when the government is shut down and you certainly can't work when you're furloughed. So I hope that for the sake of our military and civilian workforce, for the sake of our nation, that we don't get to that point. So today we, uh, in part two, are examining whether four federal agencies, including the Social Security Administration, have indeed the right workforce policies in place uh, to serve uh, our communities. SSA has suffered from underinvestment over the years. In fact, the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities reports that despite a 21 percent increase in Social Security beneficiaries, uh, the Social Security operating budget fell 
by 13 percent. So an increase in beneficiaries of 21 percent, a decrease in the operating budget by 13 percent, and that's over the last 11 years. That's an increased workload, but obviously with fewer resources. So I would encourage my colleagues to keep in mind, hopefully as we move forward with this funding agreement that uh, hampering agencies like the Social Security Agency and those of you before us today is not something that's a byproduct of the hearing. I hope that we are able to, uh, as I said before, operate and have this hearing to produce efficient and effective answers. Oversight is extremely important. And uh, I would strongly urge those of you who um, are following up on the part one that took place of this, that the request from members of Congress for information, specific information that came out of that hearing uh, is in fact delivered to the committee. Mr. Chairman, I don't have anything else at this point. I would yield back the balance of my time. 